so if you need to get a copy, here's where you can get them. Um, what else? Um, the program, really quick, we're going to have Dean Spade give some uh, opening remarks, and then there's going to be a conversation between our three speakers, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A so you guys can all ask them wonderful questions, and then we'll have, we have a ton of food and wine, so we're going to have a little reception and sell some books, sign some books, and all that good stuff. Um, there are folks photographing and filming, so if you absolutely do not want to be um, on film, please find Jillian. Um, or Randy and let them know so that they know not to film you or photograph you. Um, what else? I think that's it. I think we should just turn this. I mean, the bios of the speakers are in the program, so make sure to grab a program and sign in if you haven't already. Um, and um, these folks kind of don't need much of an introduction anyway. We have the infamous Dean Spade, and then we have, you know, the unflappable Andrew Rickman, and, you know, the ever graceful Raina Gossett. I mean, actually, all those adjectives could be so much more. Thanks. Thank you. Alright, well, thank you so much to Sabella for all the organizing work and all the other people who made this happen. But it was it's really fun to get. City and be sitting here talking to some people who I've learned the most from ever in life, and the rest of the people I've ever learned from are all here. So um, it's pretty awesome. Um, so I guess we're sort of focusing on thinking about um, abolition specifically, which is one of the spaces of overlap we all have in, um, in our work and in our approaches. So I thought I would just do a little tiny bit of talking about um, some of the themes from the book that I wrote that just came out, and then um, especially centering the abolition stuff. So. So I guess like one of the questions that we've all been asking for years and thinking about is how, um, and sort of observations we've been making is how these really rapidly growing systems of imprisonment and criminalization um, seduce and entice and invite queer and trans populations um, in various ways and attempt to use us and our resistance um, to homophobia and transphobia to fuel their growth, right? Like that's one of the like dilemmas of our times and for activists concerned with homophobia and transphobia. Um, and I think you guys already know about how massive and horrendous our criminal punishment system is, but just to be reminded, um, the stats people always give, the US has 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners, we're the most imprisoning country in the world, and we're the most imprisoning project of all time. We're, we're doing something untold, something um, astounding um, that sort of, I think, requires us to kind of have a, um, an intense appreciation and awareness of its significance. And of course that project is extremely, extremely racially targeted. More than 60% of people in prison have people of color. I recently read this statistic that blew my mind that I wanted to add to this, which is that I guess uh, black youth make up 14% of, um, of youth in the US and 58% of youth who are punished as adults. Um, just one of the examples of the many ways it's highly targeted. Um, and that racial targeting happens in, at every stage in arrest, um, sentencing and access to alternatives to imprisonment and treatment in prison, every single aspect of it, um, which has really shown in detail. Um, and of course, also in the collateral consequences that come from um, being criminalized, things like being denied access to public housing or losing other sort of basic um, uh, access to things people need to get by and to politically participate. So, for queer and trans people, there's an interesting dilemma, which is this is what a lot of my book is about, is that. There's a story in the United States that if you are part of a population that suffers from marginalization, state violence, um, economic harm, um, right, and certainly this is extremely true for, for trans people, trans people are extremely um, disproportionately low income, experience high levels of criminalization and immigration enforcement, those things of course being very wound together um, at this moment. Um, uh, you know, trans people are experiencing all kinds of harms that produce that poverty, like um, problems accessing ID, um, extreme violence in sex segregated facilities, and because sex segregation is one of the key methods of control used in all the spaces where low income people and people of color are concentrated in our society, so like shelters, jails, prisons, immigration detention centers, etc., um, there's just an enormous violence that happens for folks who um, those systems find difficult to classify or who those systems target for punishment for their failure to um, conform to certain norms, um, specifically racialized gender norms. 
Um, and because trans people um, are experiencing a lot of exclusion from social services that are also highly gendered and rely on gender, gender norms, um, and experience extreme police violence and targeting um, by all kinds of other state employees in foster systems, in immigration systems, in mental health systems, etc. Um, trans people are a population who people might give the message to, um, you know, if you're experiencing this suffering and marginalization, you should change the law. That's the story the U.S. tells about itself, right? If you are having this kind of set of conditions, um, the only part that's usually talked about in that, in that set is discrimination. That word is usually used, but I would say more broadly, state violence and marginalization, then you should change the law, because changing the law is how you change people's lives. And that story um, in the U.S. is a really intensely anti-black story. It's a story that evolves in the U.S. to say, the U.S. used to have this problem with anti-black racism, it used to be a place that had slavery, it used to be a place that had Jim Crow, but that's been resolved by law, law has declared everybody equal, and now the story of racism is over. That's the story that the U.S. The US law tells about itself, and it's a very popular story culturally right now as well, right? So this idea that, um, that racism is, is gone and that now the existing distribution of well-being and harm and violence is just neutral and natural or deserved, right? That's the, that's the underlying method. It, it, it blames those who are on the losing end of all of these systems. And it says that now we have equal opportunity. Um, that story, though, it's, it's centrally an anti-black story in the US. And it's a story that hinges a lot on cases like Brown versus Board of Education, which is the story of the redemption of United States law from racism, right? And a lot of people feel very inspired by that case, yet a lot of people are very experience a conundrum. Why are schools more segregated now than they were at the time of Brown? What is it that might not be working about um, equality law? But this story is also told in the context of lots of other struggles. We're told that um, there's no longer any for feminism, that law has made women equal, and so um, you know, don't worry about shrinking access to reproductive rights and the persistent wage gap, it's all good. Um, we're told that people with disabilities are now covered by um, anti-discrimination law and everything's fine there. Don't worry about the entire culture and structure of society being um, created in ways that are fundamentally ableist. And we're told that we have a race-neutral immigration system now, right? We got rid of the, the pesky Chinese Exclusion Act and all those quotas, and now our immigration system is no longer racially targeted. And I think most amazingly, we're told that the U.S. military is a feminist, racially inclusive, <laughs> even anti-homophobic space. Um, what, meanwhile, we all know that um, what the U.S. military does is uh, target uh, racialized um, and imperialist violence all around the world, and all, always with uh, gender violence being central. Uh, central method that it uses against people who it's targeting and also inside its own operation. Um, and part of the story that's not told when you tell the story about U.S. law um, is, of course, the story of indigenous people, because that story can't be told. As indigenous scholars like Andrea Smith and Luan Ross have said, um, genocide has never been illegal in the United States, right? So genocide is the basis of, for U.S. law, it's the basis for U.S. nationhood and, so, and, and, um, and culture. So, this story, this story about how when you change the law, you make it neutral, we all get declared equal, people will become well. Um, this story has many silences and, um, and many important things that it, it desires to obscure. And part of what's really complicated about it for all of us is that we're now supposedly living in this like post-civil rights era where the state, we've all been declared equal, and the state is now supposed to be our protector from homophobia, transphobia, um, racism, and sexism, and ableism, right? That, is supposed to be how it's working, and that feels really shocking to us, given our experiences, right? Because in the same period that we've seen the rise of equality law, and that we've all been declared equal, and everything's been declared neutral, we've in fact seen, you know, a, a significantly worsening um, wealth gap that's highly racialized and gendered, and we've seen the erosion of, um, of all kinds of labor rights, and more and more people working as contingent labor, working in more and more forms of highly exploited labor without benefits, without pensions, right? So, and working more and getting less. Um, we've uh, seen um, the emergence of sort of this, the idea of free trade, right? This increasing, uh, increases the ability of wealthy owners to exploit the labor in the environment and to crush resistance all over the world. Um, and I think most importantly, we see, and these things are included in what I just said, just the massive growth in apparatuses of state violence overall, right? So we see the massive enhancement of military projects like the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan, et cetera. And also we see domestically this outright explosion that I already mentioned of immigration and criminal enforcement systems that um, just have more people under their control than ever and articulate more violence in our lives than ever and are deeply, deeply entrenched um, with all kinds of uh, flows of capital and privatization. Um, 
then uh, really drive them, right? And that use gender and sexual violence as key technologies inside them. So for queer and trans politics, we ha we're facing a really complicated and really important, I think, pivotal moment um, where we're told that we should seek uh, legal reform and inclusion to find our freedom. Um, and you know, we're specifically we're told to seek anti-discrimination laws, hate crimes laws, access to military service, and marriage, right? Those are sort of the, the big ones. Um, and uh, what we see again and again, and what a lot of people have sort of been articulating for a long time, is that those things don't seem to save our lives, right? Um, and in fact, they build and legitimize systems that target us, right? That's the articulation that uh, many groups um, uh, whose members are in this room made against the, um, the federal hate crime statute, right? Like that, it's, that this thing actually does nothing to save our lives and builds a system, literally fund, funds a system and expands a system that is the main perpetrator of violence against our communities. Um, so instead, queer and trans people are trying to build what I call, try to call in, the, in my book critical trans politics or critical queer and trans politics, or politics that um, instead of trying to, these systems to say good things about us, um, instead tries to ask what the nature of these systems are, right? Which is a very different set of questions. Um, and does, I think, three things in the face of these systems, often does these things at the same time, sometimes does them as individual strategies. One key thing that, that folks are doing that I see is um, helping people survive these systems. So we need direct support people who are currently in prisons, jails, um, trying to access benefits, um, um, experiencing the immigration system, all of these pieces of it, right? Directly supporting people in our communities to try to survive. Um, um, and obviously doing that in a way that's not the typical like moralizing, stigmatizing social services model, but instead a politicizing uh, by and for grassroots based model that, that helps people um, understand that they're not alone in their experience, breaks isolation and invites them to participate in a broader um, movement to get at the root causes of those harms. The second piece is all the work we're doing to dismantle these systems that are harming us. So that's all the work we do when we, when we try to um, decriminalize sex work or stop the passage of um, you know, new, um, as example from Andrew's work, right, new human trafficking laws and new sex work free zones that are going to expand ways for our people to be grabbed up by these systems that are constantly trying to devour our communities. Or whether we're trying to stop gang injunctions laws, or whether we're trying to stop a new facility from being built, or whether we're trying to um, reduce sentencing around anything or decriminalize anything, right? Those are moments where we're trying to dismantle these systems that harm us, or um, trying to take away barriers to getting ID or to getting basic things people need. Um, uh, and trying to reduce the, the sort of grip on those things have in our lives. And a lot of that work actually is trying to stop their expansion right now. It's not just because, uh, unfortunately, we're often on the mid in these, in these moments. Um, and the third piece is all the work that we're all trying to do to build the alternative systems we want to live under, right? Like these um, harmful, violent state apparatuses promise us certain things, right? Like the criminal system promises, promises us safety but delivers violence, or the immigration system supposedly is going to promise us economic security but delivers violence. And so we really want those things. We really actually want to be safer from violence. We really actually want to have ways of having everybody have what they need. And we believe that's possible, but we think that the ways of doing that are exactly not what we're being sold. And instead, we need a whole bunch of other practices. Um, people are engaged in all kinds of beautiful and amazing work to do that. So the last thing I'll say is just that, um, uh, you know, we come to this work, and many people here, from this perspective of abolition, and to me, um, right now, that's a really, really, really important kind of uh, method of discerning that I think we're trying to cultivate it here in trans communities, and, and more broadly, but specifically, I think right now, we uh, I feel urgent about cultivating it queer and trans communities, um, because that abolition framework allows us to really notice how reform projects, many kinds of reform projects, build and legitimize harmful systems. And that's particularly essential for queer and trans politics right now um, because there's such an enormous global mobilization of racist and Islamophobic discourses to justify US imperialism and permanent war and the occupation of Palestine specifically, something I've been particularly concerned about. Um, and and anti-homophobia and faux feminism are, are sometimes some of the things that that's wrapped in right now. Right, that's what it's sold to us as. So we have to do this hard job of realizing that just because they put our names on it um, and say that somehow whatever it is is going to be good for LGBT people doesn't mean it's actually good, right? And we have to do this hard thing of actually trying to look at what it is, right? Is it a cage? Is it a tank? Is it a cop? Is it a soldier? Those things can't ever be good for queer and trans people. They can't ever be good for women. Yet they are being sold to us as things that are good for us and that are operating in the names of our struggles. 
Um, and so right now I think there's this really, really, really urgent need for us to be sharpening all of our skills and discerning that and at helping each other sharpen our skills and discerning that because it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite a struggle to really be able to see that and take that apart and help people understand why it's not just good because it's got a rainbow flag wrapped around it. When you have been marginalized a lot in your life or you've been isolated, that can feel, the desire to be recognized can, can overwhelm people's ability to be critical of some of these structures. And it's um, the other side, all the different forms of it know, and they're really working with it. Um, so, uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the domestic uh, analysis around hate crimes laws that I think many of us have fostered is a really important kind of hook for us to use to think about things like um, pink washing um, in Israel and other um, important um, advocates. So I'm going to start with those and then we'll hear what these folks have to say. Um, one of my biggest trans fears is like being in a movie theater and feeling like everyone's staring at me. <laughs> so, so this is like a moment where I'm realizing my fear. Um, I had a question for Andrew and Dean. Uh, can folks hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so as folks here might know, NYU is um, one of the birthplaces of Star Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. Um, from 1971, Sylvia Rivera um, was here with the Gay Activist Alliance um, protesting NYU's refusal to hold two queer dance parties in Weinstein Hall, um, which is really incredible history. And there was an occupation of uh, NYU that Sylvia Rivera took part in, um, and the occupation folded, and Star was formed out of that. Um, and I think that's just like really incredible history to ground ourselves in this conversation here. We're back in NYU, we're back talking about critical trans politics. Um, and I, so I'm thinking about that legacy. And I guess my question is, um, you know, there's so much horrible violence that you know, trans and gender nonconforming people are having to navigate every day. Um, I wonder where either one of you might see um, political formations or organizations inheriting that legacy of star street transvestite action revolutionaries um, and doing that work of resisting and pushing back. So, what are the where are those places that um, you're seeing people inherit um, that legacy of resistance, trans and gender? Because you know we're we're both consistently targeted by the state, but we're also always growing strong communities with each other and fighting back. So, it's a question <coughs> I had for both of you. And your long history. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think what's, I'm really grateful to you for bringing that history, because I had no idea about that, and, and I feel like that's the reality of our history in queer movements, and what the um, harm of this rights um, framework that evolved, um, and interestingly, sort of, yeah, started in many of the places that it's ended up, but then, um, that we've been, we've lost a lot of that. Um, and I really appreciate you bringing it back and bringing it back in this room, which is one place where I think we've really lost it. Um, but at the same time, as I'm sitting here, I I'm thinking about how amazing it is that these three books came out in this year, right? So how far we've come from that moment to now there's uh, two trans activists and a trans ally sitting in a room who have like these books that are like hardcover, published by people, I don't have Catholic Jones, same thing, like publish, and talking about these issues in ways that are inspired by um, that work and, and grow beyond it, and, um, and that that's an incredible moment, right? And then I'm also thinking about how the three of us met, like, the year Lawrence um, came down, which was the moment when we all um, became equal, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we met in the context of a report that um, I was working on with Amnesty International right. called Stonewall, Police Abuse and Misconduct Against LGBT People in the United States. And it was a really, that was a really interesting moment too, where it was like, wow, like Lawrence just happened, but there was this recognition by this big mainstream human rights organization um, that actually that was not the end of criminalization of queers um, in this country, right? And it wasn't the end of the kinds of experiences that Sylvia Rivera was experiencing, you know, um, around the time that we were talking about. And then I'm struck that six years later, you know, we have these books and this sort of body of work where the things that we've been thinking about in that context um, and beyond are sort of written down. Um, and all the work, is, not all the work, but some of the great work that's going to be out of it is written down. And 
And we're, I think one of the amazing sort of things that captive genders does is bring some of that history to, um, hold it up. Um, and when, there's this history there too, right? Of, um, I work now with Streetwise and Safe with homeless LGBTQ young people organizing and policing issues and for safety and safe spaces. And then I open up Captive Genders, and here's a story of homeless LGBTQ youth in San Francisco yeah. in the 60s organizing, you know, around safety and street economies and policing. And so to be able to have that history kind of captured and their thinking rooted in that history in these three books and to be able to have these conversations around them, I think. Um, says something about where we've come from and what we're yeah. talking about, and also where we're going. And I think also highlights that, guess what, I'm sorry, it's report, Lawrence did not liberate us. <laughs> um, and that, that the policing of gender and sexuality and of racialized gender and sexual nonconformity had preceded um, the enactment of sodomy laws that Lawrence struck down. It continued alongside them in just all kinds of ways that were about policing of poverty, policing of race, policing of prostitution, policing of immigration, policing of borders, policing of chattel slavery, policing of colonialism, um, and continued after Lawrence was struck down in the ways that are documented in the Amnesty Report in these books and, and in this huge body of work that they all refer to. And, um, and yet the sort of story was that that was the, the that was about the rights. And then that was when we could turn to the criminal legal system now to recognize us, right? And the books came out, you know, right on the footsteps again of the James Bird, Matthew Shepard hate crimes law. And then, so now we're having this conversation kind of in the wake of those things. So, um, and that criminalized queers continue to, unfortunately, even though this amazing body of work is happening and thinking is happening and organizing is happening, it's reflected in all three books, that it's still invisible in the main, like, all, like it's just amazing how deliberately invisible it is in the mainstream LGBT conversation, unless a grant appears. Right. And then all of a sudden, everyone wants to talk about you know criminalized queers uh, within the scope and purpose of the money, maybe. Um, so I don't know, but I still feel like there's also opportunities not only to continue to do the amazing work that, that is informed by the politics of money, but also within sort of larger conversations around policing and criminalization. So there's a campaign in New York City around stop and frisk called Communities United for Police Reform, CPR, that for the first time on this kind of scale is really centering the experiences of <coughs> black and brown youth who are also queer and trans, <laughs> or, or young women, um, and looking at how um, the policing of racialized gender is going on in that space, right? And seeing it as part of the continuum, and seeing the policing of gender and sexuality, as you said, as an instrumental tool of policing of race and poverty. And that's kind of a new uh, thing that we learned from Sylvia a long time ago, right. and Paul, but long preceded Sylvia, but that's now kind of manifesting kind of like in, in this bigger frame. Um, that's really exciting. So I can have other stuff, but I think those are some things for thoughts. And I feel like it's, it's really interesting to me. I feel like you've been unearthing a lot of this history for a lot of us. Like a lot of things I've learned about that period, about Sylvia and Marsha and other people have been through you and your, especially your recent work, but also stories you've told me over time. And um, it's interesting how it's really beautiful to, to follow the, the trails of how things, people don't even know that they're in a legacy. Right. And right. to me, part of what that says is that um, we are inevitably like, excessive of all of these systems that try to put us on lockdown. You know, whether that's like a film that you have to fill up that has narrow categories or is obsessed with like government documents or whether that's um, a system that has um, harmful dress code or whatever it is, right? Or all these are different intense gender norms applied to our bodies and locking us down. Like we just exceed it. Like people just constantly exceed it and then constantly innovate yeah. and and survive and then also constantly connect to each other despite the fact that we're supposed to do none of those things. Right. And that is really helpful to me. And I love that story that you tell, I think you told in Captive Genders about about that first march and you should just tell the story, where they go to um, to uh, the, the jail, but I, uh, the woman's house of detention. But to me, part of what's interesting when I think about that period and how so many movements were rising up against policing and we're trying and we're making connections across movements about specifically the role of police and like having a shared analysis about policing. So whether that's like a Stonewall or whether that's you know all over the country. Um, 
and how, if we see today's politics in some ways as a response to the very successful destabilizing politics of those movements, now we see, in the words of so many advocates, these fundamental messages, we are not criminals, right? That's the message of Florence versus Texas. That's why it's so important for the, for the um, you know, well-funded, white, gay and lesbian conservative organizations to do sodomy laws. Not because most queer and trans people are in, law, are in jail for sodomy, not at all. Most queer and trans people are in jail for the drug war and being poor, just like everybody else who's in jail. But because we're not criminals, right? And we're the other, I've just been teaching about um, the psychiatric survivor movement and, and the other message that, that all these women say is we're not crazy, crazy. Exactly. right? Whereas in, in, the, there's, in the article I was teaching, which is amazing, called by Gabrielle, Col Gabrielle Coleman, they were talking about how all these movements in the 60s and 70s um, were questioning rationality. So there's like famous quotes by Martin Luther King about how like, if, it's, if this is sane, if white supremacy is sane, right. I hope I'm insane. I mean, there's sort of right. questioning yeah. of rationality by lots of movements <clears throat> and questioning also how like uh, mental capacity is policed and then also exposure to the harm of asylum and all these forms of imprisonment that are medical and psychiatric. So that's the other message. And then the third message everyone's supposed to be delivering is we're hard workers. Right, mm -hmm. and so there's again, it's like no questioning capitalism. I mean, it's like these, it's like, which is the reverse of, of a lot of what the messages that were being given, which is like we don't want to have to work in these degrading, dangerous, exploitative jobs in order to survive. This is not what human life is, right? And so it's interesting to me to watch how movements today have aligned with state interests in these ways, mm -hmm. and it's so important to hear counterexamples that are contemporary or historical to ever just be like, they made this claim that's supposedly um, impossible to make anymore, that's supposedly like taboo, which is, you know, that's the response I get a lot when I share my work with people is like, what you're saying is impossible. People are so shut down to even desiring connection, innovation, excessive ways of being. So I, I don't know, I'd love if you really show that story made that too. Which one? The story about the March 20th. Oh yeah, so the story <laughs> is that the, um, you know, some of the folks and the, there are some folks in the room you know, who have participated and were there, and I'm thinking about Randy Wicker, who was filming, you know, who was um, you know, part of this history, right? Um, and who was a friend of Marsha B. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. But the first um, gay pride, the first Christopher Street Liberation March, um, you know, started off at the Women's House Detention Center, uh, and it wasn't a coincidence that Afini Shakur and Joan Byrd, who were part of the Panther 21, were currently incarcerated, um, because there were political connect there were connections between different political formations. And, you know, it's only relatively recently that um, that you know anti-policing is not part of queer and trans movements, right? Or I should say, you know, like LGBT movements. It's only relatively recently that people aren't talking about that. Um, like larger national gay and lesbian organizations. And I was smiling while you were talking because at, uh, on Monday, AJ, my friend, and I were walking from the Her Story archives um, in Park Slope after having watched Sylvia Rivera get up on stage in 1973, um, you know, right after she was beat up um, by people who didn't want you know, trans people to talk, right? Um, and she got up on stage and she was, you know, and this is like footage I had never seen before, and I've been doing you know a lot of this kind of research. And um, she was on stage, and she was saying, you know, talking to middle class white people, uh, and talking about how they are leaving out their brothers and sisters who are currently in jail. And I think that's a huge part of this history that we inherit. Right in 1970, um, there was a march at the Women's House of Detention. In 1973, Sylvia Rivera is on stage talking about how brothers and sisters who are in jail are being left out of the movement. Um, and I think we can trace that alongside with this push to become normal, right? This push to say, no, we're not crazy. Um, no, we should get homosexuality out of the DSM. Yes, we should, uh, I mean, yes, we should get homosexuality out of the DSM. Um, yes, we should get gender identity diagnosis now out of the DSM. You know, there's these pushes that ultimately really hurt marginalized people and marginalized communities. And I think that's something that was really interesting you know, it's, it was only three years later that Sylvia Rivera was, you know, yelling at this movement, um, saying you're leaving people behind. And star street transvestite action revolutionaries are the people that are holding this legacy. Um, so, yeah, that's a very great So, I have a question as well to you, yes. which is, um, and it sort of goes along with. Um, the, to sort of within the context of the strategies that we're talking about, the history that we're talking about, you know, we've heard a lot in the last couple of weeks about how the LAPD has come up with this new policy um, for uh, relating to trans 
transgender people who are in their custody. And I'm wondering particularly how we measure those kinds of things, which were developed um, in part in response to community sort of uprising. And one of the more um, inspiring things I got to see when I was um, doing the research for the Amnesty Report was a group of Latina trans women <coughs> called Cartenas Unidas who mm -hmm. were like, protesting outside the Hollywood police precinct, uh -huh. just demanding respect. Like, right. just, and there was tons of them, and they were just yelling, and not yelling, but like really, they were yelling, but they were demanding respect in ways that, that the precinct couldn't ignore. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where the captain of the precinct would meet with them once a month to hear their concerns. Now, we talked to him afterwards, and oh, well, they were sinking in. But, um, but at least he <laughs> felt like he had to make that gesture, and he had to respond to their demand to be heard in some ways, and, and at least pretend um, or enact hearing that. Um, and so that demand came from people who were directly affected. Some of the negotiation around how that demand happened was more the mainstream LP organizations um, and some T but upper class white organizations. But if we're, I've been trying to think about how we measure them against those three things that you're talking about, like organizing around survival, which includes survival inside, um, taking tools away from them or doing harm reduction, and then coming up with alternate systems. And how do we measure those, like what do you think about those projects in the, or those, the LAPD sort of policies within the larger frame of critical trans politics? I have a quick response and then, um, which is just some context. And what, so this isn't a response, but this is what it made me think about, was um, this action that happened uh, against the Rama Park police station in the early 70s, um, in the, so that's the Los Angeles area, um, against police violence towards trans people. Um, and it was a really incredible action that, again, I learned from, from my friend AJ um, about, you know, so three trans people had just been murdered by the LA, um, LAPD. And so people gathered at the Rama Park police station and were protesting um, using magic, right? So people brought a hollow tin can and people brought a pencil. Um, and then they like rang them together to make this ominous sound and they chanted raise, raise, and they wanted to raise and elevate the Rama Park police station and make it disappear. <laughs> and so, you know, and it reminds me of, so when you were talking about trans people who are protesting outside the Hollywood police station, um, I just, I can't help but think of this context of this long legacy of resistance, right, towards police violence. And what I think about when I hear the LAPD building a jail specifically for trans people, um, you know, one is the kind of the reporting around it is just really gross and disgusting. But two is that um, it somehow allows people to forget that the primary source of violence towards trans and gender nonconforming people are the police, right? So this legacy of um, pushing back against violence around our lives has always targeted the police. So having a jail just for us in no way solves the problem of police killing us, police uh, you know, harming us, police and you know, inflicting incredible amounts of violence on our lives. So I, I just I hold those two things and I think about um, how insidious the prison industrial complex is and how it always co-ops our desires to have safety, right? And it's this fantasy that, um, you know, if you allow the prison industrial complex into your life, you will be safer. So whether that's if you allow the prison industrial complex into your life by having a trans jail, you know, in LA, or if you allow the prison industrial complex into your life by having uh, a jail for mothers and children, which was something that um, New York City was trying to build just a few years ago in the South Bronx that some of us um, you know, in this room were organizing around and against. It just really co-ops movements, right? So, um, so it's not surprising that this is happening and because it, that's part of what the prison industrial complex does is co-op movements and what it is like striking to me is that it's divorced from a primary um, site of violence in our lives, which are the police. You know, so I just think about that when I think about the LA. When you were talking about Rampart just now, it made me think about um, Dylan Rodriguez came to speak to one of my classes uh, earlier this semester, and he, he was really great. It's always interesting teaching students that they're mostly not abolitionists, at least in the beginning. Um, <laughs> 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 I should really study on how long the last time in class ends, but <laughs> better not to know. Um, 
you showed us this the slide of the um, of the LAPD recruitment. Um, like they like the LAPD has like a recruitment page, like just with like Asian American police officers or just with black police officers, just with Latino police officers. Like they have like really specific ones, right? And he was talking about how um, responsive the prison industrial complex is, right? So it was just like you know, there's been this like you know critique from the you know from the origins of policing in the United States, which is free for career justice to learn more about, um, right? It, that's fundamentally a racial project, and so there's this enormous critique, especially um, loud in the United States in the 60s and 70s about um, uh, racialized policing and the fact that the, the all these white police are in these communities of color and the colonizing, colonizing force and the LAPD has got a great response to that. We'll hire a bunch of people of color to police the city and most, and he was saying, you know, most young people that he, that he has worked with or, you know, been part of organizing um, with in, a, in the LA area have never had a white police officer be the one who's beating them up or arresting them. All the white people work back at the station with high up jobs. Mm -hmm. Nothing about this is surprising, right? but just really it was, I think it was powerful for my students to really, it was like a, a, an illustration of how these systems work and it's really intense to see them um, do, doing it better and better with queer and trans stuff. And I think the dilemma with this kind of um, new reform is to both acknowledge the work and the intentions of people who worked on it and to be like, you know, we have shared desire to address the horrifying experiences of trans people in custody. Um, and also to have realism about the likelihood that this will will build, will be, build any solutions because we actually already know of lots of trans people who are in different forms of isolation in different prisons and we know um, of cities that have certain kinds of policies around arresting trans people and it turns out that from at least what I've seen in my studies of you know just whatever living in cities that have had and things like that mostly um, police still do all the same things that police do in the same way that you, the LAPD can hire people of color to arrest you but it's still going to be concentrated in communities of color, it's still going to be highly violent and it's going to be a terrible job for people doing it and a horrible life for people um, who are targeted by it. And so trying to be realistic about whether or not these kinds of solutions can win us what we want. Um, and then the other question for me always is how did we win this, right? So sometimes we do win things that are incremental and insufficient but the way we went about it actually built enormous power in our communities in some way or another mm -hmm. like and that's to me a really different thing than when like white lawyers went behind closed doors and pulled certain strings and certain you know letters were written from elite organizations and something was won that's unlikely to be a very meaningful or durable win and also the things that are going to be asked for are not going to be the things people are most targeted or going to have wanted on them, right and so I think that these are the kinds of analysis that we've all been trying to build, like actually figuring out does this thing that says it's good for us offer us any actual relief, and if so, at what cost? And, then, and also, like, how can we be, if we want to do campaigns about our safety around policing, what would the demands of those campaigns be if we were, if, we, if the right people were in the room making the demands? And also, even if they were incremental demands, what, um, how would we have done it? Who would have gotten to do the organizing? Whose leadership would have been built? Um, what kinds of next demand? We, if we know what we're going to get is going to be inadequate, then we then at least it's good if we built something along the way that's going to make the next demand the next demand. If we built a set of relationships and skills and um, and people who are fired up and who um, you know have a place in the movement and have broken certain forms of isolation, and that um, you know is often not the case with wins like this. And so I think that that's one of the things that's hard for people to digest. There's no even. I'm thinking about the fact that in 2003, when we went through the Amnesty International research, they told us about the gay tank uh, in their right. memory, and then and and they told us about police. Like this is like beyond on top of the like it's not going to prevent violence. It's just going to make people like more like easier to find to commit violence against in one place. Um, and and by the way, we stop why they're in there in the first place. But then there's like even more messed up policing that happens. Right. So to get into the queer tank, um, they used to call it that, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna keep repeating it, but to get into the, the place where they were holding LGBT people at that time, and mostly they were thinking about G, um, they had these two white gay police officers who would police whether you should go into the gay um, cell. And they would do so by asking you questions that were designed to ferret out if you were really gay. And they would ask um, trans women, for instance, about glory holes. And trans women would be like, I have no clue what you're talking about. And they would ask like the immigrant, um, because that's, you know, they were yeah. part of a different sexual culture. Right. Um, but somehow that was the, the line between who was gay enough to get this protection and who wasn't, right? And then they would ask um, you know, undocumented asylum seekers or immigrants who had just like, come over the border of Mexico about Judy Garland. 
<laughs> they would be like, um, and, um, and then they weren't gay enough to go into the protection area, right? And then they would ask, um, you know, gender conforming young black men who, you know, would present a certain image that people did not understand to be, you know, the traditional gay image. And they would take tremendous risk to, to step to someone and be like, I need to go there. Um, and then there'd be like this whole questioning interrogation that would come that would in the end end up with them not getting in there but now being completely exposed. Um, either for snitching because they spent so much time talking these cops, it must have been that they were snitching or that they were trying to get into that area which then signaled that they were. So yeah, that's what makes me think of in addition to things that you guys talk about. Now what's, what's the policing going to be about who's trans enough? to get into that area, right? And then are we going to be talking about surgeries? And are we going to be going into all the things that Dean talks about in his book about what what denotes gender and what now, what what's where's the box around transgender, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what the, this was? Was that an invitation for questions? Please. Yeah. I'm just making sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is a rather uninformed question, but I'm gonna like put out things that I feel like are connected and ask you guys to see how they are, <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah. So, um, Dean, you like started talking out by like the connection between neutral, natural, and deserved, right? Um, and like trying to connect that with like how those ideas are like intimately connected with reform projects and how they work together. Um, and also like, we talked, Randy, you were talking a lot about like just like these beautiful like stories of history, right? Um, and like I'm also interested in how we find like the histories of like of failing, right? Of like mm -hmm. of those moments that like that like where things moved into into reform. I like to speak specifically, I like worked for like a the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, which is like a really horrible place. Mm -hmm. um, and like while I was there, like a bunch of like old documents were like unearthed and given to us as like a look at our old history, and they were like beautiful, right? They were like um, like talking about like supporting prisoners and like how we used to have like reentry programs, and it was like a big joke at at our like all staff meeting with like 300 people who worked there, like oh like look at this work that we used to do, right. and like joked around about how there would be like no possibility that we would do that now. Right, um, and so like we have like we're trying to like unearth these histories of like how this movement was our movement, but I'm also interested in like how we make sure to find those histories of like when things went 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 bad, and like how we failed and like what those moments look like because I feel like fearful of them. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a very wandering question, but like those things feel like connected to me. So if you guys could speak on those a little bit, to be gracious. I can talk just a little bit about something I'm thinking about for the last part, like how, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are charting kind of the homo nationalism, neoliberal emergent shifts in kind of queer and trans movements over time. And one of the things that I think about is um, the rally that I was talking about before 1973 um, in New York. So I just want to talk about New York because that's more of what I know. Um, you know, up until 1973, the Christopher Street Liberation March would end in Central Park, right, which was a free space. People would hang out. People like Randy would go and, you know, interview the nudists, and you can watch those videos on YouTube, and, um, you know, people would just, Sylvia would be there with Marsha and the star banner, and just, like, really, it'd be a space that wasn't um, policed in the same way. And, there's kind of a nostalgia, right, that I'm speaking through, and so not everything was perfect and great. Um, but in 1973, uh, that was like four years after Stonewall, what happened was the rally ended up at the bars. Um, so rather than going to Central Park anymore, which was a free space where people could just hang out and be with each other, the end point of the 1973 Christopher Street Liberation Day, now known as Gay Pride Incorporated, ended up, you know, at like, all these bars that were, you know, some of them were owned by the mafia, right? So Mike Umbers, who was the owner of one of the places that Star House was in, owned Christopher's End, and that was a bar that the, you know, the movement ended up being in, and it would also end up in the bathhouses. 
Um, you know, and how did this happen? Because people with money became part of the committee that would figure out where would Christopher Street Liberation Day end, right? So it went from a decidedly political event, um, you know, in 1970, rallying around the Women's House of Detention Center, to a uh, very clear, not political event in 1973, um, in order to get people into the bars and into the bathhouses and away from um, spaces that were free, so people could start capitalizing on queer and trans lives. Um, what coincided with that was also this incredible amount of violence towards trans women, right? So um, the Lesbian Feminist Liberation, which was a formation in New York that came out of the Gay Activist Alliance, um, started talking and espousing this theory of um, trans women are actually men and they actually have male privilege and they should not be part of our movement. So in 1973, not only did the rally end up in a place that wasn't free, that you had to pay, that was largely like about consumption culture, but it also was um, really exclusive towards trans people, specifically trans women. Um, you know, and Gina Leary got on the stage and talked about how Sylvia Rivera was a man, um, and Sylvia Rivera was kicked off stage, and Vito Russo, you know, was part of this violence, and um, Vito Russo was kind of this iconic gay figure um, who passed away a little while ago, and so did Gina Leary. Um, so I think, to me, what's interesting is the shift in tour, the shift in greater violence towards trans people from within the movement coincided with the shift towards more money in the queer movement. And I think that's something that's like, that's one of the legacies that we inherit that's really powerful and also like very much haunting to this day. You know, it's like the National, Le uh, National Gay and Lesbian um, Task Force, which Gina Leary is one of the first co-executive directors. Um, really does some great work and also is a, a way that holds that kind of consumption culture and um, this legacy of being anti-trans. Um, so those are the two things that come to mind. When you were telling, saying that, it made me think about this process I'm sure people have been through where like there's a conference or gathering at the first two years, like everyone's like housed in people's houses and it's in all these like spaces that are like, volunteer spaces and there's like free food at lunch and then like five years down the road it's in like a giant convention center and you have to like show ID to get in and like it's scary, it's in a part of town that like is highly policed so that mm -hmm. most people won't be there or whatever, just yeah. interesting those yeah. movements. But, um, what made, uh, it made me think about too, the stuff that's in the book The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, mm -hmm. about how the nonprofit form encourages us to never admit our failures because we have to always be like competing for the next grant and you have to always think that funders think you did the right thing. So A, it also directs our energies towards things that are considered um, successful strategies and that means certain kinds of scale which always means going towards money and elite sources. So like to get yourself covered in the corporate media is considered a strategy that would make a funder like you or to get a court case or something through a legislature whereas to build um, significant relationships and capacity to organize in your local community or to shift or do paradigm shifting work of that kind is can't be recognized in the same way. The other piece of it is that people can't ever acknowledge losses. So like to me a very obvious example is that it was a terrible idea for the um, uh, gay organizations that decided to litigate the marriage case in, in uh, California that led to Prop 8, right? Like they litigated this case literally just over what that thing was called since domestic partnership in California already covered those same things and they, they litigated just on what they call like the dignity issue of it being called marriage and then they got this Prop 8 thing because they hadn't done any of the basic groundwork you would need to do to actually organize for a backlash and who feels that backlash, right? Like, not people who are trying to make sure that I can share my benefits with my partner. They're not the ones in the face of it. It's people in foster care, people in jails and prisons. When homophobia backlash is stirred up, it's gonna hit people who are most vulnerable to having their lives controlled by somebody who's having a homophobic <laughs> feeling because something's going on in the media or in the legislature or whatever. And so, to me, that's it. Like, that is like, wow, let's acknowledge, there, this is a huge strategic failure where we saw the failure to create organizing on the ground with an elite strategy that, did, that didn't build up multi-community backbone and investment and you know real coalitions created a huge backlash and but that's not acknowledged like I, I never have heard that acknowledged anywhere like there's and so to me that's an interesting piece around how <coughs> we're inside structures that can't allow us to learn from failure because failure is such an important part of all of our work like we're experimenting and there's counter moves from whatever it is that we're um, up against and the last thing I want to say is the question about I thought it was really interesting what you said about how Establishing how I heard it, establishing current conditions and systems as neutral, natural, and deserved is part of 
trying to only reform the market, right? It's like the same investment. And one of the things I think is really complicated for us is, of course, we can only take incremental steps from where we are. And so, so a lot of things we want to do are reform projects, um, like even just stopping a gang injections bill or um, decriminalizing sex work. Those are reform projects. And so, I think what I've been trying to think about is how do we build the right sets of critical questions to be asking, so that we can weigh our incremental steps and say to ourselves. Is this leaving out the most vulnerable people? Is this going to work for everybody unless you're undocumented, or everybody unless you're in prison, or unless you have a felony record? Right? Or are we dividing our constituencies by raising up our reform that's only going to reach the, those who are easiest to include? Like, there's a huge number of questions we could ask ourselves. But to me, having ways to assess reforms and kind and kinds of shared critical questions is the is the dilemma. So we can figure out whether to go with them, since it's not really an option to not do any reforming. And so asking whether or not the reform option we're considering pretends that the system or conditions are neutral, natural, or deserved is maybe one of the roots or something to that. I mean, I think the, the moment, I, I think I heard the question you're asking is, how do we see the moment where we're going to go down the wrong road ahead of time and walk away from it? And so I think the two things I heard were when money shows up on the table, that's when we're about to go down the wrong road. <laughs> um, and I'm saying all these things super self-critically as someone who like, just started a nonprofit, even though I was part of on nonprofit industrial complex and um, every day see like the grinding messed upness that we just talked about. Um, and then also when we start believing in the work that we're doing within the system as work that's actually going to produce change. So I was recently part of a lawsuit where we won. Yeah. And Okay, first of all, that doesn't ever happen. <laughs> like, interns work for me, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm interning at Lost Causes LLC. Like, you know? <laughs> so it was super shocking to all of us. We were like, whoa, like, sometimes you go to court and you win. And I had 24 hours, kind of like the 24 hours after Obama was elected. I had 24 hours where I lost my mind. And I thought that you could go to court and win shit and get justice. And then, and then I gained my, my senses and realized that, in fact, that was not the case. And that it hadn't fundamentally changed the underlying conditions. So that's another moment where I think you can see disaster happening and, and walk away. Um, and then the one that, that Dean just said feels really important to me too, which is that when it requires you to buy into leaving some people out or to framing yourself within their boxes. So I think one example, and this we really have to, and I so appreciate Raina how much history you bring conversation because we keep having to learn from that, right? So, so, and Dean was mentioning the trafficking stuff, which I always don't want to talk about, but in the end, I think we do. So, the line around who gets to be a victim, whether it's getting into the trans cell um, or wherever, is highly racialized and gendered. Highly racialized and gendered. And so, the, so uh, one other place where we um, could see disaster looming and should turn around and walk away is when we are arguing to be seen as victims by mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. um, because both feminism will um, rise up and, and then police who gets to be a victim in the same way that those cops police who gets to go into this safer area, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what's happening right now in the same way that it, it's been happening over time around you know, domestic violence laws that you know, we want a, the state to punish in our name and protect us, around hate crimes laws, we want the state to punish in our name and protect us. And that's how we'll know the state values the lives of women. That's how we'll know the state values the lives of queer and trans people and LGBT people. And now this is how we will know the state values the lives of young people who are criminalized or in um, survival economies or who adults who um, are experiencing violence. This is how we'll know. There'll be laws that punish people harder for um, you know, violence against us. But then it's being implemented by the system that, as we're talking about, is it's rooted in policing gender, race, and class. I just I don't know how to say any more. Like, it's foundational. It's from the moment like Christopher Columbus got here. That's the, I don't want, I can't speak to what happened before because we don't have enough information. But I know from the moment he got here, this whole system has been about enforcing racialized gender norms in, in, in ways that were about serving colonialism and imperialism. That's, there's nothing else about it. So there's no way you turn a system like that to protect us. It just doesn't work. And so the other place where we can see disaster ahead and walk away is when we start thinking that maybe for this particularly outrageous kind of violence, or maybe for this particularly you know, um, 
horrifying thing, the system might just work. And the place where I'm most challenged around that, I have to say, is around police who do harm. Mm. Because then I think, well, they should be prosecuted, right? <laughs> right. But what I tell you is that it's mostly cops of color who are prosecuted, for instance. I, so I'm always about, like, cops rape people. Like, hello, cops rape people all the time with their badges on and facilitated by the badge. And, um, and I end up wanting, well, obviously, I want accountability for that, right? But then, so the calls for prosecution. Guess, guess which cops get prosecuted for rape? Cops of color, because men of color get prosecuted for rape in this country and not white men, you know? And, and so it's hard in that moment. Now that's a place where I have to see disaster looming and walk away, even though I'm like, but that kind of violence, I want recognition for that kind of violence. So we all have, and so the, the other thing which is we all have to recognize that we all have those seeds inside us, right? I can listen to Dean and have like the most brilliant, smartest friends in Reina and Gabriel and Pooja and all the other people in this room who will constantly cause my head to explode and think, um, critically about all these things, but there's still that stuff in my head that I have to check myself on all the time, including like these moments that I so I so appreciate your question to all of us to keep in mind like where those disaster zones are and to to steer away. Yeah, I want to give one example that so I was on a panel with Eric Stanley recently and he was talking about in San Francisco. I think I'm, and I'm obviously going to maybe get this wrong, but he's like about some jurisdiction that has like a diversion program for um, people um, arrested uh, for being in the sex trade and how like you have to go to like this prostitute school and like it's run by a former sex worker or something like that, right? But it's like it's incredibly expensive for the people who have to go to it. And then it's also just like back to the old fashioned thing that women's prison and prison has always been about, which is like how can we teach you to be the right kind of woman usually in a racialized gendered way, make you into like your right class position, like you know, go be a domestic in someone's home or whatever it is that, that women have been in prison have been trained to do. And it just, it was really interesting. And I live in Seattle where there's this new idea to, um, we have like this this one facility near, near where the university where I work that's like a set of court buildings and a youth jail. And the court buildings were so dangerous with asbestos and whatever that they stopped using them. But of course they kept the youth in the jail. And now they want to like put $200 million thing on the, on the ballot and rebuild like the whole thing and just like make it so wonderful and new. And, Justice and like um, give it a lead certification. Yeah, it's going to be really amazing. Um, and so a lot of people are, are pushing against it. So I've been kind of trying to dig in with like your people I know about like trying to understand all the different ways that we're going to oppose it for totally to win. Um, but in the meantime, what I've been learning is that all of the money that ever gets funneled in, at least in this uh, in my region, but probably elsewhere too, into trying to build alternatives for youth and whatnot, it all requires you to be arrested first, right? So part of the problem is there's this whole world of professionals who really believe in courts. A lot of them are judges or former judges, lawyers or former lawyers, and they have built this entire industry that says we love kids and we don't want them to go to jail too much. We need a jail for them. And But all the way to get the alternatives includes first having to get arrested and having to have all these relationships with the police and all the things we know happen between uh, police and people who are arrested. And it's all centered around that. And the idea that like, what communities would need to not have us need to jail would be things like child care and health care and elder care and like awesome schools and awesome after school programs and arts programs and theater programs like that. We you, that you, we can never divert that money because it has to you have to be arrested. Like that's we care about you once you're arrested and like that whole thing. I just think it's so sticky for us. You know, like we have to be so critical as we move towards all of our solutions. And part of it is that stuff about, around acknowledging failure. And I think. Um, that's why abolitionism is so important and also why it's so such a marginalized discourse um, amongst people who are building those careers off of those reform programs. Feel like victims and that may be um, you know, that are experiencing violence violence against them. So I think the example I'm thinking of is like a trans prison or a trans wing in a prison where that feels like the state, you know, regulating and, and as victims and, and contributing to this problem. At the same time, you have trans people in prison who desperately fear for their lives and would, you know, wish give anything to have the opportunity to be in a facility like that. How do we reconcile the big picture with the fact that it's not it can't happen overnight and and we have individuals who have, you know, a lot, are very vulnerable and have a lot at stake. In um, by asking ourselves those questions that I think Dean was putting out there, and I think that they're constant, careful, balancing questions, right? And that's and what I was saying about what I was cautioning us is to just not think that that, that when we're dealing with that individual case or trying to do the harm reduction issue, that we don't then decide that's the be all end all. But you know, my co-author, um, one of my co-authors, Joey Mogul, talks about how 
you know, she used to be part of the committee to end the Marion lockdown, which was to, you know, stop this supermax prison and, like, you know, shut it down. And they were like, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. And then they started getting letters from, you know, the prisoners who were like, awesome work you're doing, but can you just get them to turn the lights off for a few hours a night so we can actually sleep? And, you know, they had to have a, like, moment where they were like, oh. Um, and then they had to wrestle with that question because they were like, we shouldn't have to be arguing for you to get the lights off for a few hours so we can sleep. We should be arguing that you shouldn't be on 23 hour lockdown, like, that you shouldn't be caged inhumanly, right? But you have to navigate those things. And so, I feel like SRLP and I and other folks who are doing this work like have this conversation with ourselves all the time and with each other all the time about what are we doing that how are we striking that balance. But when someone comes to me um, who wants you know accountability for violence, I mean my number one question to them is like what would make you feel safer? And then and then we dig a little bit further, like because it's usually call the police, get the police or whatever. It's like okay, let's play that out, you know and is there real safety at the end of that? And is there something else that might, we might be able to achieve that has a little bit more safety and think creatively? But that requires us to really, you know, but, and also to take super, super seriously the third question, which is what are we doing to build alternatives? Because if we're not doing that, and we're just talking theoretically all the time, and like having a great conversation about prison abolition, but we're not building the alternatives, um, and that's not alternative like diversion programs that create this arrest mediated referral system. Like the young people I work with don't need to be arrested to be referred to a system to help them exit the sex trade. They need to, when they're banging on the door every night saying, I need shelter, I need shelter, they just need the shelter. Like they don't need to go through the system to get to the shelter, which then will have bars on it. Like it's not, or we'll have this like, you know, why don't you respect yourself more message, right? It's like I respect myself fine, that's why I survive every day, you know? Um, so I think that, uh, that's just the rant answer to your question, but um, <laughs> it's, it's, that, um, it's that it's mediating, it's figuring out in that moment like what's going to increase safety, but then also to not, to really build those alternatives that are not like alternatives that are through the system, but alternatives that are outside of the system in real ways, but that, that really have to address increased safety. They can't just be sort of theoretical. Um, we have to wrestle with how that looks. But in a moment, I mean, if someone, need something, we're going to figure out how to work whatever systems there are to make it work for them. And I'm not saying you should sit there in your pain and with the lights on all the time and wait 20 years while we abolish the prison. I think also there's like a false tension in, the, in right. this that, um, that's that's not really there. It's part of that for me is that um, all the movements that are, and all different organizations I know that are most trying to abolish the system and dismantle it are the ones that recognize that the reform doesn't work, that they're, that, like, at SRLP we have, you know, a large, large portion of our clients are people who are in prisons and jails, and there isn't a one-size-fits-all um, solution for them. Some of them are trying to get into administrative segregation because that would be safer in their facilities, some are trying to get out of it. Like, that 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 group of people wouldn't be more protected by like a New York state wide regulation that created a, a trans jail. We see that because you can be really harmed and targeted inside the um, you know gay and trans tank and lots and lots of systems. And so I think part of it is like a abolishing the idea that there actually is relief from that. And then B, those are the same organizations that are actually doing all the immediate relief work, right? Like Lambda Legal and the ACLU. Like these groups don't they don't have a direct services wing, right? It's critical resistance and SRLP and groups like this that are actually doing like direct support to people in prison right now. And I think that's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that the groups that want to get rid of the root causes are and, and have like big solutions ideas are also the ones that have the most contact with people inside and seen the failures of some of the reforms. And so to me, um, you know, one of the guidelines I feel like we learned a lot early in SRLP from um, TGI Justice Project in the Bay Area was they had this sort of guideline of doing vigorous advocacy for individual prisoners and not moving towards trying to reform a whole system. Um, and a lot of times the system might contact us and be like, you know, if we were going to sleep for all trans prisoners of the system, what about this? And it's always something that's actually a really terrible idea, like let's build more prisons or something that just won't get at the needs, or that wouldn't work for all the different people that impacted. And so that, to me, was a really useful, I, obviously we don't believe in like any kind of rigid rules all the time, but to me that was a very useful guideline, like vigorously advocating for individual people versus building the system. And so we have you know, tried to work on that, like let's dismantle the system and vigorously advocate for individual people. So I think that that 
the, any suggestion that people who are trying to get at the root causes are abandoning people in the system is one that we have to really resist because it's a really common logic. And I think that um, it's not the case if you look at like who's acting on the ground. Okay. Um, at the risk that, you know, this is a silly question, what are your visions of an abolitionist future? When you imagine getting there, when you imagine getting there as if there's one place to get, what, what are the alternative systems that, you know, float through your heads? <laughs> like I always start from this question. Do you want to start? <laughs> um, okay, what I there's very few things I know about the future because um, a, a capitalist society foundationally built on chattel slavery and colonialism has destroyed my ability to think of anything else. But um, what I what I try to think about um, there's something called the Critical Resistance Insight Statement that ends with, uh, which was by Critical Resistance, which is a prison abolition organization, and an organization called Insight, Women of Color, which is called Insight. Um, that's a, a, an organization that um, looks at ending violence, ending racialized gender violence um, in all its forms, state and personal and community based. They put out a statement together about the sort of the interactions between building safety and abolishing prisons and what that looks like. And all I, I mean, there's lots of stuff in it that's really amazing, but one thing that sticks out to me is this is, if they, at the end, it calls for society based on mutual um, accountability and responsibility for each other's safety and well-being, and in a really radical way. And so I try and vision what that looks like or what something around that looks like. And then the other thing that I think about is um, when I learned from Alex Lee um, in a chapter that's republished in a book called Abolition Now, that says it's not just about tearing down the walls of the prisons, it's about fundamentally changing the things in our societies that allow those walls to exist in the first place. And when I think when we hear about that practically, like I was recently at the Drug Policy Alliance in California, I guess last year, and you know this report, again, don't be aware of what you think you want. The Supreme Court says, California, you're holding too many people in your prisons. It, they're overfull. Decarcerate. Send people home. And you're like, oh, every once in a while, they go for the good one, right? <laughs> um, not so much. So what we hear when we go out to California is that they're sending people home, but then they're imprisoning them in different ways in their communities. Um, and not only that, but now they're making them pay for the privilege of it. So you have to now wear an ankle bracelet and go pee in a cup you know, every five minutes and, and do all these other things that are about literally continuing to control your behavior. And now people are like going into bankruptcy and this huge amount of debt with criminal justice fines because they have to pay for their ankle bracelets and their pee testing and their weekly parole visits or their daily parole visits, whatever. And when you're on probation and parole, you know, you give up all your Fourth Amendment rights around the search of your house so people are in your house all the time and they're policing who lives there, all, all kinds of stuff, right? So, so there was, you know, we got rid of the prison for some people, but then there was a society and the way that we approach certain issues continues to reproduce the prison in different forms. And um, sometimes this notion that we divert people from uh, prison to services then just reproduces it in different forms, right? Where like you're mandated to treatment and you're forced, you're being punished through treatment and through involvement in social services and systems that you either couldn't get what you needed from in the first place or you ran away from because they were, you know, reenacting and reinforcing violence. So that isn't, so this is my limitation. I have trouble coming with a positive vision. I can just say what it won't be and what it should include. And then I look to these ones. Um. I think one of the reasons why like, I'm so invested in this kind of line is like, in science fiction and like speculative fiction and fantasy is because the colonialist project, part of the colonialist project is to really colonize your imagination, right? So you're not able to imagine a world without, or you know, a US, a nation state, without prisons, jails, and detention centers, and um, forensic psychiatric institutions, um, and you know, homeless shelters that are policed or group homes that are alternate forms of incarceration. So you're not able to imagine outside of that, even though you know the prison industrial complex hasn't always existed in the US. Um, and I think that one of the resistance strategies towards that is, um, for me, like really 
engaging in science fiction, speculative fiction, fantasy, and um, imagination. And I think that's something that, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of people at Silver Rivera Law Project are really into science fiction. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's a coincidence at all. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, so another thing that I think about is how, um, you know, when I was working on Critical Resistance, one of the things that we talked about was um, interacting with each other in the ways that you want to um, create you know, a community that wouldn't have the present industrial complex underpinning safety, uh, or ideas and fantasies of safety. Um, and so the shorthand for that, we're, we talked about like prefigurative abolition, right? So living, um, a, you know, out our prefigurative politics, where our politics prefigure the world that we want to, or the community that we want to be a part of. Um, and some really like, some ones that I've, you know, this is a, a small answer to a really large question. I've just been, you know, really thinking about um, like interpersonal violence, especially within communities um, that are really heavily resisting the prison industrial complex. So, low-income communities, communities of color, undocumented communities, communities with disabilities, um, homeless people with HIV and AIDS. Just thinking about what are some of the issues that play out in our community, and one of them being largely, you know, for trans people, isolation, right? And um, pushing out people from our movement. And I think about the story of Sylvia Rivera because, you know, in 1973 when money entered the grand trans movement in such a heavy way, um, she had to fight on stage after having helped create this movement, and she was beaten up, and she went home and she tried to kill herself. And I think about how um, how that you know that's a form of like interpersonal movement violence um, and harm towards each other that the prison industrial complex is just so able to capitalize on, right? So there's not safety for trans people. Let's create um, a trans jail, right? There's not safety for queer people. Let's create a queer jail. In Rikers Island, there used to be like a gay tank. Um, and critical resistance was responding a lot to what does that mean? Like, how do we advocate for safety um, for people who are currently incarcerated? So I think you know the short, the long answer to your deep question is um, interacting with each other and building community that prefigures our politics around state violence and our politics around what does it mean to be um, accountable to each other and acting out of a place of interdependence. Um, so what that doesn't mean is acting out a lot of the harmful, oppressive stuff that still happens within movements that the present industrial complex is able to exploit. And then I think about like some really concrete you know, resources like the Revolution Starts at Home that came out from South End Press or um, you know, Mimi's Project Creative Interventions um, that you know, documents the stories of people who tried to intervene in um, violence that happened. So maybe it was stranger-based violence, maybe it was like interpersonal violence from communities um, that already knew each other, or maybe it was like intimate partner violence. And then I think about Safe Outside the System that is actively organizing with um, community residents, with people who own um, businesses in bed -Stuy, to create spaces where people who are queer and trans and benefiting you know, people who aren't um, can enter when there's a conflict, when there's a, a violence between a person and their friend, or a person and a stranger, or a person and a police officer. Um, so those are some like nitty gritty ones, and um, the larger ones for me are prefigurative politics and really pushing inter <coughs> movement and inter community violence, um, and then also science fiction. I'll start <laughs> You can come and not that way, you can't get out. <laughs> um, I think the other piece of it too is that because uh, because of no, no no prison system like this has ever existed, we can it's like we can just look at every other kind of place. <laughs> like that's one part it's small, right? Like, that's one that's like it's like the easiest answer in the world. It's like kind of awesome because it's just so outrageous. But the other thing I feel like uh, is that we can just you know I, I was talking before about how. I, I was like I think part of this like you know we exceed systems right and that systems like capitalism 
and the PIC are always trying to find new markets and new ways to get in, right? So like now, like now your entire social life can happen through these devices, and it used to be this, and now you have them without it. So like right, new markets and new things to be commodified that didn't used to be. Um, and so you know whether that's through with like you know um, taking over a rock or whether it's through creating new uh, new needs that can be sold. But there's all kinds of parts of our lives that we don't deal with using the logic of the PIC in little ways. And I was on a panel recently with this really smart. Um, um, actors from Portland, and she gave the example of how like you could be at a party, and somebody's getting ready to leave the party drunk and drive home, and they're about to commit this like incredibly dangerous crime, that's like you know hugely dangerous crime, and you don't call the cops. You like they're like hey don't drive home, stay on this couch. We're calling you a cab. We're taking your keys away. Somehow you all manage to stop this incredibly like life threatening, possibly murderous, dangerous crime without the police. And there are about a million things we all do each day that way, and then there are lots and lots of things that we've lost our skills about doing. So I feel like a lot of the projects, like the ones that Rand was naming, are projects about realizing that we have some skills that we could build, and that there's some skills we are missing that we could actually cultivate in our communities. And one project that does that in uh, the town I live in, in Seattle, there's a domestic violence organization called the Northwest Network, and they have relationship skills classes for like queer and trans people, and. It's just like, what if we actually had ways of talking about what healthy relationships are, what are common pitfalls of relationships in capitalism and white supremacy that happen for a lot of us, mm -hmm. so that then when something's going on with myself, I have a way of talking to a friend because we have some shared language, or if I see something happening with you, I can, I can bring it up and not be afraid of that, and that we might do a lot of prevention in that way, um, because it turns out we do need more capacities around relationships, there's a lot of violence in, in our relationships, right? Um, and so to me, there's a lot of things around prevention. And one of the things my students always say without fail every semester in every class we talk about abolition, and they all say, what about serial killers? Uh, it's like, it's, you know, and that is because we all watch, like, you know, like Law and & Order and CSI are only 24 hours a day. You would think everybody in prison, you think there are like 2 million people, serial killers, for example, right? Um, that's what you think the system is about, and that's what it's for. Of course, we all know that it's not for that at all. But to the extent that anybody by that description exists, I mean, first we have to have, like, an entire critique of ableism and the ways in which um, we're pathologized to produce this image of this monster. Um, but also, to the extent that that exists, it's also a function of this society. That hasn't always existed. That figure has not existed in all societies at all times. So that's another set of questions. Like, I believe that's actually something we can prevent. We're told <coughs> we are an intense um, aspect of ableism right now that all um, uh, forms of non-normative behavior and ways of being mentally and emotionally are brain chemistry issues. Mm -hmm. But in reality, a lot of what happens um, in our brains and minds and behavior is related to the society we live in. Like, maybe all of it, right? And to trauma, right? And most people who engage in harmful behaviors um, even though that's not mostly who's in prison, but people who do engage in harmful behaviors, most of whom are like running the government and military and police force, um, may also have been traumatized. That's one of the main reasons people engage in those. So there's like enormous work that we can do to prevent all of this, and we actually know how to, we know a lot about that. Like we actually know a lot about this. And I think one of my favorite things to read about this is on the Generation 5 website, their organization that seeks to end child sexual abuse in five generations. They have this PDF called uh, Toward Transformative Justice. They just do this amazing analysis about why criminalization will never get rid of child sexual abuse and what might it look like to try to build the kind of society that didn't have child sexual abuse in it. Um, and that, so I, I just recommend it because it's a great document also because it's like an issue that we all often <coughs> have really like retributive feelings about, like you were talking about police rape, like we have, it's, it's awful. And so um, it's an it's a important place to start. It, and yet it's totally endemic and so we could possibly lock up everybody who might do it because it's so many people. And certainly, the criminalization um, approach has done nothing about it. We can see that pretty clearly. It's super endemic still. And so the question is, how do we think about this totally differently? And I think those kinds of um, discussions people are having are about what kind of world, what kind of people we'd be, and what kind of world we'd live in that didn't have certain forms of violence and desperation that do produce um, harm. And that also, I think the biggest thing for me is I want to say, like, if we close down all forms of prison today, we would already have reduced violence. So I don't think we need to build the alternatives before we can close the prisons down, which is one of the things I think people get confused about or have different views on. I think if we, if overall, what they are is they are violence, right? They are racialized gender violence. So if we close them all down, we would have to do a lot of scrambling as we already have to do constantly to protect ourselves from it and to deal with the outcomes of it. Um, but the other piece of this is that I think, and you said this in the question, like there's not an arrival point. Like abolition is not an arrival point. It's really not one that we can imagine now, just like a lot of people say revolution isn't, right? Like that what we're trying to do is just, you know, really move towards what are the processes, questions, and ways of being that we're cultivating to decrease all these things that make us be able, be able to dehumanize each other and kill each other and support systems that do that to us and that 
recruit us to work in and, and be agents of those systems. And that's like you know, a deep, ongoing, certainly lifelong process for all of us. And we don't even know how many you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that's been going on and will be going on. Um, and that, um, that's a sort of prefigured politics piece for me as well that you brought up. I just, I would say really quick, I mean, I think there's three things about what you guys said. I mean, one is the example you gave about drunk driving. And just like thinking about it, it's like abolition sounds like a really big project. It's kind of overwhelming. I think I'd rather just go watch that TV. <laughs> you know, it's just too much. But but that's a really simple way of thinking about it, right? Another way that um, an example I've given is I heard someone tell a story about how some a woman was being sexually harassed on the bus um, in Brooklyn. And at some point, everyone on the bus like handed the woman their cell phone to call 911. And I'm like, why did they all just come up with a plan to get harassment on the bus, right? Like, so instead of like devolving it to someone else, to the violent system, right? So it's small acts like that. You don't have to set up. You know, I mean, I think it's like an amazing project, but I think people sometimes feel like, well, if I'm not in the community that has the amazing project, or I don't have, I don't fit kind of in that amazing project, I can't do this work. And there is ways to do it every day. And then I've also heard from people who've been involved in movements that I really um, admire or am inspired by or whatever. The thing that fundamentally changed it wasn't the day they overthrew the government or the day they took over the entire, you know, whatever, and created this amazing new society. What fundamentally changed it was they transmit, what was revolutionary was transforming their relationships to each other. And that's what made the other thing possible. So in the same way that abolishing prisons requires us to abolish the things in our society and ourselves that allow prisons to exist and produce prisons, we also then have to find the things that will produce in ourselves that produce the other things. And we really have to challenge ourselves. Like, I'm challenged all the time by, I mean, I remember a specific instance where someone had done me harm and I was like, railing about it to Dean, and Dean was like, okay, whatever, but you know, really, no harm, no exile for nobody, no shame, no exile for nobody. And I was like, okay, but is this person? And then they were like, do you like, no, no shame, no exile for nobody. And I was like, okay. So, but, but, and I still struggle, wrestle against that in myself. Um, and so I think we have to really just keep looking at those impulses in ourselves, not just with respect to serial killers, but people who like mess with us in mm -hmm. ways that aren't even physically violent or um, or sexually violent or violent in the ways that you know we traditionally know as violence, but that we have these um, inclinations or responses that are ultimately what produce the things that we're fighting against. And that we have to start from there. Uh, thank you to all of you. This is all really inspiring. Um, I'm I'm sort of caught in the I don't know if tension is the right word. You talked a lot about the false tension, but, but Dean, you were speaking a little bit earlier about, um, the, well, let me start here. So we had the privilege of having Michelle Alexander come to campus earlier this week, and that was also really inspiring. And she talked a little bit about the challenges of incremental change and how maybe there isn't, um, that's not going to be good enough at a certain point because maybe we're going to plateau at some place that's you know satisfactory to the majority and then what happens when we scale up from there and the race to incarcerate starts from that level and nothing she really says nothing short of a major social movement is is going to change a lot of these things and i think you know you're bringing a lot of complications to what that looks like and how do we do that principally um, and, and taking that idea and what's really inspiring about what's happened over the last year with the Occupy movement and the importance of holding that line of continuing to ask the difficult questions within revolutionary spaces and challenging the recreation of oppressive um, relationships or um, within, within what can and potentially ought, you know, could be revolutionary spaces. Um, so I guess what I'm caught in and what you were saying is sort of this um, the tension that you end up taking where when sometimes you are, um, the, the negotiations and compromises that you have to make um, with the broader allied community that you maybe consider yourself a part of. So um, what it means when the, the gay and lesbian and transgender community is mobilized towards what you view as an elite goal that's not going to answer for the most vulnerable populations that you are advocating for. So, um, and what that means when you have to um, take a position that's unpopular within your own community. Um, and that's because I think that something about what you were mentioning about the dignity fight, that, that resonates with a lot of people. There's a reason why, and it's something that we can hook ourselves on, and it buys into so many of the logics of what justice means. 
right? Like people really do, it really does matter intimately to a lot of people who may not be benefiting from the privilege of marriage. Um, but, but there's something about that dignity that resonates on a human level. And so how to negotiate that line of taking an unpopular position within a community you see yourself advocating for, um, and how to, how to sort of work within that on a practical and organizational level as much as a theoretical level. Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, movements are all full of um, divisions and contradictions, and that's a sign of health. Like, it should be that we are, like, really arguing with each other about whether or not this is a good strategy. If we're just both, like, you know, that, if that's right, and if everybody's just, like, this is the right thing to do, that wouldn't be healthy, and that's one of the problems with, um, like, contemporary gay and lesbian rights movements, or I, I actually don't use the word movement for that formation, but the sort of gay and lesbian rights formation that's primarily um, led by a few elites. They make decisions without any kind of membership organizations donors are the decision makers, and then we all have to either follow along and get excited about it, if the media is good enough and makes us have our heart straight side, or we are critical of it building something else, but yeah, anyway. Um, but I feel like the um, intra-movement difference and intra-movement like, debate and conversation is really, really healthy. And an example of that to me is like when um, a bunch of organizations um, opposed the uh, federal, um, you know, Matthew Shepard, James Byrd, Hate Crimes Act, um, uh, and release statements about it, um, and those organizations were organizations that center racial and economic justice. That's an unpopular move, of course, because other people are like, oh my god, for the first time ever, gender identity is going to talk about federal law in a good way, um, and it's going to send me millions of dollars to local law enforcement all over the country. Um, that is so important, right? Like, and it doesn't mean that. Um, it doesn't mean those movements are trying to, or those organizations are like exiling people who are believe in that or excited about it. It's that the bulk of their members don't think that works for them. They've had conversations, but sometimes like a lot of what you know, social movements do is um, political education amongst members, right? So like, I mean, an example I often give is that inside SRLP, people are from very different experiences, even if they all may identify as trans people or a lot of people are low income, people of color, or whatever. And so people may show up and like somebody, I'm harboring a bunch of xenophobic ideas and somebody else there is an immigrant and somebody else there has a trans identity that I would, wouldn't currently have thought was an okay way to be. And people like, you know, intra-group difference actually strengthens movements and organizations, right? Like ideally, you come to a movement to get something you need, like you want to break your isolation, you want to help your eviction, you want to help with your immigration case, whatever. You show up at movement spaces and ideally you end up growing through that because everybody's growing because we're all confronting intra-group difference and finding shared solidarity. Like that's the way strong movements build. Um, the opposite of that is when elites tell you what your agenda is, um, you are, there's a lot of propaganda around it, like right, we're living in like an entirely like family values era in American politics that's push people towards uh, marriage fantasy. There's also, if you're not watching Law & Order, you're watching like Say Yes to the Dress, right? Like <laughs> weddings are the current, the, in the current moment of economic decline. Weddings are something that you can get people to spend money on against their own interests, so they're highly, highly, highly advertised. Um, and, uh, and so people have a lot of, compli we have a lot of complicated emotional attachments to a lot of st state structures, and, our, and movements are a space where we get to actually work on battling that out with each other and demystifying each other and like calling each other on like our everything, like our fat phobia and our ableism and our, you know, like actually having to wrestle with that and figure out and build ideally shared analysis about what's gonna help us get by. And so to me, um, it can be very uncomfortable to take those positions. I actually think a lot of SRLP staff um, as examples are often in positions of having to, we're like sitting at the, you know, 24 hours a day, we're like sitting on some panel full of uh, white lawyers talking about gay issues, and we're like raining on the parade, you know, like talking about prisoners again, you know. And I think that that, um, and that's a really important role that people always are playing in, in all movements, right? Inside the immigrant rights movement, there are people who are saying, you know what, we need to stop portraying some immigrants as like non-criminals and others as criminal immigrants. And inside every movement, people are. Um, having those battles about how big the demand is going to be. Um, and I just want to go back to the thing you said about the Occupy too, because I feel like um, at least the Occupy Seattle, which um, we call decolonize Occupy Seattle for important political reason, um, that I won't go to um, right now, uh, that space has been a space where people have really had to struggle with this, because in the encampments, which has now been um, taken away, but um, you know, all the things happened that happened in our society. So there was sexual assault, there were people who didn't think homeless people should be there because you know, they're just there for free food. There's all, every kind of intra-group difference and the violences that occur. 
And people were trying to figure out how to do that in a right-on way. Like how to act, you know, so there's a transformative justice group emerge that's trying to deal with the sexual assault issues, now that using the police, like people are having debates about the role of police, debates about whether or not to ever get, um, kick somebody out of it of the encampment. These are the questions. Like, I was, you know, it was a shit show in a certain number of ways, exactly like the rest of our society is. It just didn't have, it, you know, I mean, it, didn't, it, it was trying not to use some of the mechanisms our society uses to cover over um, the true difficulties, tensions, traumas, violences that we're all living with and that we embody. And, um, and I think that, like, one of the key things that, like, justifies the logic of exile that we see in our own movements is the notion that there is somebody out there who is the racist or the sexist or the transphobe. That figure is the figure that we all fear being and that we all see, think we can root out of our movement or our group or our friend circle. And that is one of the most damaging things that is the PIC inside us, right? Because in reality, we all articulate violence and oppression through various moments. And if I know that, then it might be okay for me to, someone to be like, Dean, the thing you just said, like, it, it sounds racist to me, or the way that you're operating in this group um, is about white privilege. And I might be able to be like, oh, God, it, I, I, of course it hurts to hear that. I'm bummed out. I might be sad. I might have grief. I may have all kinds of emotions. But I can actually be like, that's a possibility. But if I believe in the figure of the racist, I'm going to be like, oh, no, I've done these things in my life about racism, so I can't possibly be that person, right? And that whole time, or the group's going to have to decide whether to like, evict me because I'm the racist, right? All, that entire formation. If we decide we can't kick anybody out of the decolonized occupying encampment in Seattle, we have to think of something else. And so to me, those kinds of practices have been really, really central to what this movement or moment has been like, has been because there's encampments. The encampments have this specific, specific potential. And there were some people who were from more upper class um, backgrounds or white people who didn't want to have the encampment anymore. They're like, let's just do this more like non-profit style. Like they didn't want to have necessarily non-profit, but like let's like move indoors, have workspace, have work groups. But all these people who are just here to live here and eat here and stuff, you know, it's messy, it's uncomfortable, you know what I mean? And that, and it really was messy and uncomfortable for many good reasons. And it was exactly, I thought, what the most important part of the work was and is, um, and, and still is as they work to, um, to have a new encampment. So I just wanted to add that piece in because I think that that's one of the places where we see the prefigured politics that we're going to talk about. <laughs> oh yeah, I just actually had a really quick comment and a question that might tie into closing statements, which is, um, you know, actually I'm really glad, Dean, that you mentioned the uh, um, North, Northwest Side of Seattle because I went to a conference, uh, a gathering of folks, and they had this really good sort of sci-fi <laughs> analysis or, or a, a fantasy analysis, which was thinking about safety from... Um, you know, community accountability and safety from like a zombie apocalypse analysis. I don't know if you guys have heard this before, but when you talk about the zombie apocalypse, it's this whole idea that like, if there's a zombie apocalypse, how are you gonna survive, right? So in the example of when the state has failed and you're not gonna call the police and you can't call the army and you're not gonna look to the government, what are the strengths within your community to build, right? I know this person who knows martial arts. I know this person who's like really good at survival skills. And I thought that was a really good, great way to think about and imagine what a new world would look like, thinking about what are your community connections and what skills you have inherently. Um, and so on top of that, I guess the question I had is what, and this may sound kind of hokey, but you're also speaking to a room full of what, like future MPAs and future lawyers and other folks in the community with a tremendous amount of privilege. And so I guess I'm wondering what tips or or sort of things or suggestions that you have so that we can either continue these conversations amongst ourselves and also think about like where our positions will be in the next few years, how you can um, transform that system um, by simultaneously, you know, critique it and, you know, uh, subverse, like add subversive elements to it. So I'm just wondering about what your guys' thoughts are on that. <laughs> um, okay, I'll just briefly say, um, yeah, I like the zombie apocalypse idea too, um, and, and that gives us a chance to already see what we are, how we already rely on ourselves, and we're going to see little things people are already doing, like maybe in your town, people, in my town, people are like, people are, like trying to have chickens and like have their own egg or like grow their own kale and stuff like that. That really matters. Like an actually, you know, we're like they know how to fix each other's bikes or they know how to reuse certain things. All of that stuff. It's that's the kind of stuff. You know, that's the, the, the daily practices. Um, but I guess uh, one of the things that I've gotten out of my semester, this semester, is that 
It would really be useful to people who are um, being professionalized into helping professions of various kinds or reforming professions to, to stop thinking about the idea of helping others or advocating for others. Mm -hmm. To just utterly abolish the notion of like that entire hierarchical relationship and to move towards like um, accompaniment, support, and being in it with people while also, of course, always recognizing our positions of privilege. And I was just at a conference with Angela Harris and she said something about how in the um, environmental justice movement they'll say, not lawyers on top, lawyers on tap. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that's a cool idea, right? Like, how can I take my very minimally useful technical skill that mostly is about illusions about how systems work, isn't really about how they work, and if it's helpful to these people, offer it to them while remembering to decenter it. That's the opposite of like the lesbian gay rights thing, which has been all about centering um, legal equality as the way to liberation and freedom um, in the recent like um, decades. And so I think um, for all of us, like especially to remember that the, like graduate school and all kinds of schooling, they train you to tell you you are they're tra they're training leaders and to just be like my definition of leadership is that I forward others' leadership. It's like you know, like to really move away from the idea that I then am supposed to be in charge, help others design, you know, the answer to their problem, um, that the right person from a graduate school is going to, like, think of the way to end poverty. Like, the, these are the kinds of, like, sort of, these are the ideas behind, like, you know, foundations and, and graduate school. So I think that we need to um, just utterly let go of that, which is a, which requires letting go of a certain grandiosity and privilege that many people have been trained for since birth. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's, uh, one, one way, I mean, I, so I've talked a lot today about how I spend a lot of time critiquing um, myself and, and thinking through, but one thing that I, I, I reminds me that I'm on the right track is that I often actually forget that I'm a lawyer, like genuinely forget. <laughs> and someone reminds me, and I think, oh, great, yes, I have a magical superpower that I could use to get you arraigned. Um, um, but, but I think it is remembering, um, and also your zombie apocalypse moment made me remember that, um, that I have an undergrad degree in animal science, and so when the zombie apocalypse comes, I can milk your cow and eat it. Um, and so, so I think that the thing I remember is that, yes, one, we all have multiple skills. Um, and to remember to keep uh, growing all those skills and to not fall prey to this notion of professionalization or leadership or um, uh, there's like this policy advocate identity out there, right? Because the person who like analyzes and thinks about like to not go to that identity, to go to the identity of I have lots of different skills and, and how can I use each of them to actually advance this revolutionary goal um, or, and help build this revolutionary world, I think really is the, is the way to think about it and to not, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because there was a point in time where I was in conversation with people about um, doing the work that I'm doing now. People were saying, well, lawyers should be doing that work. Um, organizers should be doing that work. And I was like, OK, first in the animal science thing, like I shoveled shit for longer than I've been a lawyer. And I was an organizer for longer than I've been a lawyer. And so I sort of was like, what is this dichotomy? Like, mm -hmm. lawyers should be doing this work. Organizers should be doing it. Or youth leader people should be doing it. And I was like, I never stop being an organizer. Um, and, I understand where they were coming from because the instinct was that there should not be people with all this privilege doing this community organizing work with, you know, building youth leadership or doing youth organizing. And, and often people, including the employee work with, they're like, you're 43, what are you doing running youth organization? I'm like, trying very hard to make it so that you run it. <laughs> like, you know, working very hard to do exactly what you're talking about. And so I think that, uh, yeah, remembering multiple skills following the zombie apocalypse moment and thinking about what that world looks like and then trying to build it every single day through every kind of work that we do. And and then, yeah, just making stepping away from this identity that there's people who are going to, through just passing the right policy or striking down the right law or implementing the right um, thing or even writing the right book um, or, you know, giving the right speech or having the most revolutionary mind-blowing thought is going to be what's going to transform the world in the ways that we want to. It's none of those things are going to do it. The more we move away from that and just recognize that we all have many skills and many perspectives and histories to bring to every situation and, um, and to be about building leadership and creating space for more and more and more and more people to be part of the conversation. It's a thought. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think those are really powerful answers. The only I guess I would just add a couple things. I think a lot about how Ella Baker used to talk about how strong people don't use strong leaders. 
and really challenge the idea of like the charismatic leader being the person that is necessary for a movement to succeed. Um, and so I, I try to like really constantly re think about that, remind myself that um, you know like I don't need to do well on a panel in order to be a person who is like a strong person and is with other leaders you know, moving a, you know self determination movement forward. You know. Um, and another thing I think about is how the like engaging in what isn't strictly considered the, the rational. Um, so I, the Allied Media Conference recently started having a track just around speculative fiction and science fiction. I think that's really important, right? That um, the tools that we develop through formal education aren't necessarily the tools that are going to um, contribute to making strong leaders by making strong people. Um, but that like formal education is often sites of colonialism. Um, and then, so I think about, for me, like I think about how important dreaming is, and um, about Star Galactica again. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> um, and then, uh, I was gonna say one other thing, which is um, not necessarily strictly related, but I, in my closing commentary, um, how many people have heard of CeCe McDonald? Uh, it's like most of the room. Um, so CeCe McDonald is a person. Does anyone want to talk about who CeCe McDonald is? You want to talk? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh no, I'd like you too because I. Don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone in the room who wants to talk about CeCe? No. Okay. Um, so CeCe McDonald is a woman of color who is trans, who is a black woman in Minnesota, who is. Um, currently facing uh, two counts of second degree murder. No, it does not make sense. And things don't have to make sense, you know, which is great. Uh, but in this case, this is like a really tragic situation where Cecil McDonald was resisting um, transphobic violence from a group of uh, white people in front of McDonald's on June 5th in Minnesota. Um, and it was a really tragic case because one of the people who was enacting transphobic racist violence, Dean Schmitz, was killed. Um, it's not clear who killed Dean Schmitz, but um, Cecil McDonald is being tried for the murder of Dean Schmitz and was also um, really physically hurt in the process of this, um, you know, defending her sense herself from violence coming from this group of white kids in front of McDonald's. Um, She's going to pre-trial on April 4th, April 24th, and then her trial starts on April 30th. Um, so it's an issue that's like really important for us to mobilize around, um, and that it's connected to all the things that we're talking about. And um, I think it's a really powerful, you know, moment where um, because of you know these books that are great because of the community organizing that's happening, because of the strong lives that people are just living in their own communities, whether or not they're related to any organization, formally or informally. Um, you know, gender self-determination and trans and gender non-conforming people are really, um, you know, building strong movements, um, you know, for our lives. Um, and this could be a way for us to engage that, not separate from a larger movement, right? So, like, I think it's important to keep C.C. McDonald within the context of, like, there are a lot of trans people who are spending their lives in many forms of detention. Um, this is a powerful opportunity to mobilize around one um, and continue to support movements, um, you know, to free everyone. Uh, so, I think that was one thing that I wanted to add. It just made me think about what I want to say earlier about um, people reference Michelle Alexander and her book and the sort of conversation that it's generated. And I really would ask everyone who's part of that conversation and inspired by that conversation to commit to expanding that conversation. Because yeah. Cece McDonald is not part of that conversation. And Cece McDonald needs to be part of that conversation. And she was kind of intentionally left out of that conversation. Um, and that's part of the reason why that conversation is getting so much play. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really our um, our responsibility to, to put some other folks into that conversation because the, the people who are the yeah the, 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 the queer and trans people of color are part of what that is being talked about but the ways in which it happens and the impacts that are specific in general and just the lived realities of queer and trans people of color um, are not being 
centered in that conversation in a way that is another kind of violence, um, uh, taking us back to what you were saying earlier about Sylvia right. um, creating a movement and not being able to speak in it. I just, that may remind me of two quick things, which is like really <laughs> challenge this economy of outrage about whose lives matter, right? So like there, to me, I feel like I'm having more and more conversation around this economy of outrage, right? That um, some lives are important to mobilize around and we'll never hear the stories of other people who are navigating similar amounts of violence, right? So the, I think it's really powerful that people were mobilizing around Trayvon's um, death, right? But how many people knew about Duana Johnson being murdered in Memphis? And I think that there's a real system and an economy of, um, of outrage that keeps some lives from ever being known about um, and that keeps some lives like, from being talked about, uh, that keeps some lives only being talked about after their death. Um, and then also challenge this idea of like the most authentic person. And I think that's something that um, comes up in our movements a lot, which is uh, we have to find that most authentic person, which sometimes right now it plays out, we have to find that um, you know, person who's trans, who's a person of color, who's low income, who has disability, who is also undocumented, who has HIV and AIDS, like, who is um, currently incarcerated. Like, there's all these ways that we replicate some really nasty oppression just by having this idea that there's the most authentic person um, who is the most marginalized. And I think that's something important to challenge. Sorry. <laughs> also, we have lots of things to say. Yeah. Also, um, to, to also resist the box piece too, right? Yeah. Because I mean, one thing that I've really um, been thinking a lot about lately in terms of my work is, um, you know, I, I my political home was is insight, and, and my work started actually from looking at state violence against women of color, and then through <laughs> trajectories, you know, expanded to state violence against women LGBT people of color. And I've been thinking like really more and more and more deeply about how um, <coughs> how the sexualities and bodies of women of color who are not trans um, or queer identified and queer and trans people of color are racially gendered mm -hmm. in in similar ways, and so we need to build bridges. This notion that like, okay, we're gonna organize around LGBT or queer and trans people of color and not think about non-queer, non-trans women of color when society, frankly, queers them all mm -hmm. and frames all sexualities as deviant, it feels like we're not building in the ways that we need to. So I think it's also about just blowing up. Not only looking right. for the most oppressed person, right. but also just seeing the connections um, in the ways that um, will really help us leverage and broaden. Yeah. All right, let's have some snacks. <laughs> <laughs>